You went to Berkeley? No, 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 I go here. Oh. I did here. Oh. Yeah, I'm switching my art school degree. Oh, okay. okay. I got that degree. So I'm writing about um, Shane Hayne, who's a particularly performance artist and uh -huh. video uh -huh. artist. Okay. I'm going to start right now. Do you want to wait a couple more minutes, or do you want to wait a couple more minutes, or? Uh, I don't know. If you, it's your call. I mean, if you think, uh, yeah, we can we can begin. Okay. Hello, and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm Kathy Denning, for, former Laurel Award intern at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. And I had the unique experience of working on the exhibition West of Center, Art and the Counterculture Experiment in America, um, which is still up, and this program is in conjunction with that exhibition. Um, we planned an incredibly packed and exciting program schedule to accompany West of Center, in addition to tonight's program, next week we have two final West of Center themed events. On Wednesday, April 24th is a panel called Women and Girls Riot, an intergenerational discussion on radical lesbian feminist communities, which is moderated by the exhibition's co-curator, Elisa Author. On April 25th and 26th is the Art History Association's exciting student symposium, experience and experimentation an investigation of alternative artistic practices. We hope to see you at all of these upcoming events. And you can check out our website or our Facebook page to hear more information about the program. And I would also like to thank the Department of Architecture, the Department of Art, and the History of Art and Architecture for making all of these events possible tonight. And now to introduce Chip Lord. Chip Lord was trained as an architect and is an artist who works with video and photography. Chip Lord, along with his classmate and friend Curtis Schreier, founded the Experimental Media and Architecture Collective Ant Farm in 1968. Ant Farm engaged in fringe research in architecture on two different levels, a utopian image-based practice using media and a practical do-it-yourself activity in air-supported structures and nomadic living. As a member of Ant Farm, he produced the video art classics Media Burn and the Eternal Flame Frame, as well as the Cadillac Ranch sculpture in Amarillo, Texas. Ant Farm crossed disciplinary boundaries into performance, multimedia, and public art within the context of the radical changes going on in the art world and social landscape in the 1970s. In 1970, Ant Farm famously traveled cross country in a media van, shooting video and networking with other artists. Chip Lord's media work straddles documentary and experimental genres, often mixing the two, and ha he has been shown widely at film and video festivals and in museums. In 2005, a retrospective of his video work was shown at the Reina Sofia in Madrid, Spain. In 2010, he completed a public video art piece for the remodeled Bradley Terminal at LAX Airport, titled To and From LAX, which I hope many of you had the pleasure of viewing last night. He is Professor Emeritus in the Film and Digital Media Department at UC Santa Cruz. Please join me in welcoming Chip Lord. Thank you. So we could go ahead and turn the fluorescence off. Oh. My what? Okay, sorry. Oh, I didn't get mic. It's going only to the video. So one one minute, one moment, please. I'll just put it in my back pocket. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me now? Not quite. Not quite. Okay, I'll move it up. 
testing, one, two, three. Th is this the University of Oregon? Is it 4-17-2013? Can, can you hear me? <laughs> ah, okay, well. Uh, I guess I should keep talking and hopefully it will evolve. Uh, the, the talk is titled uh, Ant Farm Then and Now. It has a historic component, but I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about uh, a couple of recent projects that are revisiting of ant farm work. And <coughs> um, how are we doing? Better? Okay. So uh, Ant Farm existed from 1968 to 1978, and it was uh, founded in San Francisco by Doug Michaels and myself. And in 1968 was the year I graduated from uh, Tulane. I studied architecture there. The kind of funny, it was a Bachelor of Architecture degree in 1968, but uh, 25 years later, it became a master's of architecture degree when the uh, accreditation you know, rules changed. But um, in 1968, there was revolution in the air. There was a student movement that was transcended the US. And nobody in my graduating class really wanted to go and work in a corporate office building. After all, the Bank of America and Chula Vista had just been burned down as a protest against the Vietnam War. So we decided to found an alternative architecture practice. An underground architecture practice is how we described it to a friend. And she immediately said, like the ant farm I had when I was a kid. And there it is. It was instantly, uh, we had a name. Uh, it was a perfect metaphor because you can see that above ground is a very traditional architectural scene, a rural farm scene. And, but underground, the ants are building these more, much more interesting biomorphic spaces, if you can keep the ants alive. Uh, in terms of uh, influences, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite buildings when I was a, in a second year architect architecture student, the Boston City Hall. It's a classic, maybe the quintessential example of brutalism. And, um, and then uh, the whole Earth Catalog was first published in 1967. And for me, it became a kind of graduate or post-undergraduate uh, post uh, education. Um, one thing that went, every, every uh, issue of the whole Earth Catalog uh, ha began with a, uh, a section on Buckminster Fuller as part of whole systems. And uh, of course, I, we knew about Fuller from being architecture students, but this was a, a way to amplify that um, knowledge, let's say. And then, uh, obviously, uh, Archigram was also an influence since they preceded Ant Farm by 10 years or so. But I think another influence from that period of time was Marshall McLuhan's book. Um, and this was actually a collaboration between McLuhan, who was uh, well known as a uh, communication theorist, uh, with a, a graphic designer, Quentin Fiore. And it was a repackaging, of, in a way, of some of his academic writing. The medium is the massage. But you know, ultimately, we just wanted to be like a rock band. And uh, so this is the, the album cover. Um, so some of the, the first architectural experiments we did were using, uh, simply using parachutes, uh, military surplus cargo parachutes, very large parachutes, as um, which we named the dream cloud. Uh, as structures, uh, and of course, they were very limited as a, as a piece of architecture. But if you had a strong wind, you could get lifted off the ground, uh, off the ground um, in the dream cloud. And so these were uh, a series of experiments that were done 
uh, while we were, Doug Michaels and I were teaching at the University of Houston School of Architecture in the spring of 1969. And um, we would document these, uh, uh, these ephemeral uh, experiments. I, I realized much later that what we were doing was symbolically the opposite of brutalism. And so naturally we were reacting against our training and our education and it manifested in these structures which were lightweight, uh, movable, ephemeral, and in every way the opposite of, of brutalism. We, we, we also um, <coughs> shared an interest in photography and as a presentational medium. And so we would photograph these, um, th these structures and then collage them. Uh, often that was as simple as using two slide projectors to superimpose images, but um, sometimes it was a little bit more complicated. And it, it afforded the possibility of starting to create, uh, you know, a more complicated form of uh, architectural, not so much presentation, but uh, the architectural idea, the, the imaginary spaces um, that were often collaged with technological images, you know, which we were thinking would be an obvious integration um, with architecture. So <coughs> there, there's a similar um, uh, matrix of images in the, the exhibition. It's, it's not this one though. Th this one is more focused on uh, this couple <coughs> at the center. A and this was a project we, we called Kim Enviro Man, she's Enviro Woman. They're connected to a computer. The computer is generating their uh, environment, generating the architecture. Um, so <coughs> th this idea was presented as a, uh, a two carousel uh, projection side by side. And it meant that you, know, you could put any sort of image up next to Enviro Man and the, I, you know, the connection was instantly made. Uh, and, uh, and yet the, the actuality of course was that this was just a guerrilla photo shoot in a, a lab uh, at the University of Houston. It had no technological uh, basis. It anticipates virtual reality in a sense. We were ready for virtual reality but we, we weren't going to be the um, inventors of it. Um, there was also a, a performative aspect to uh, the, the early work and uh, I, I think it comes out of, uh, in part, my own experience in the Halpern workshop uh, which I attended in 1968 uh, after graduation. And um, so that's also another component of the West of Center exhibition. Uh, and there actually, I think I did find a photograph of myself uh, from that in the exhibition today. But <coughs> in terms of performance, the idea was not to be uh, dramatically on the stage, but to simply uh, be technicians who were operating a continuously involving uh, environmental experience. Uh, and this was this performance and, and multimedia, a multimedia experience. Uh, and, and this was done in uh, 1969 at Houston and it was called Plastic Businessman Meets Space Cowboy. Uh, <coughs> briefly, uh, another performance that was I think more overtly connected to a political message was uh, uh, done in uh, in Los Angeles in, uh, I think it's 1970, and it was called Gas Station. It was part of a experiments in art and technology festival at uh, University of Southern California. Uh, our piece consisted of uh, turning off the lights, showing, projecting slides of gas stations on the wall and lighting this highway flare and placing it in a, in a cake. And it happened to be a classroom on the campus. And uh, of course, we were wearing uh, gas masks. 
And by, by the end of the very, sh you know, rather short performance, which was defined by the duration of the highway flare, the room was empty. So the, the audience understood uh, that aggressive performative style, I think. Uh, tomorrow is Earth Day, or the, the day after tomorrow. And uh, th this is a shot from a, a piece that was done on the first Earth Day in 1970. Uh, it was, we were invited to come to the University of California at Berkeley, uh, Sproul Plaza, which had, of course, during the 60s had been the scene of uh, many student protests. And we uh, put up this inflatable and we fashioned a, uh, uh, a fiction that, and of course, <coughs> I have to say, the air quality in the Bay Area was very smoggy in 1970. And so it didn't take too much of a fiction to say that, uh, to announce using a portable megaphone, there's an air emergency, everybody inside the clean air pod. And people would go into the clean air pod and <coughs> um, you know, it was simply uh, an agitprop architectural performance in a way uh, to, to put across that message. Now, uh, because we're about to celebrate whatever anniversary of Earth Day, uh, there was an article uh, reflecting on that in the New Yorker last week. And what uh, it reminded me that uh, uh, the, the writer said, you know, Earth Day actually had consequences because uh, the Clean Air Act was, uh, was passed in 1970, the Clean Water Act in 1972, the uh, Endangered Species Act in 1973, and the, um, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency itself was founded just eight months after that first Earth Day. And <coughs> It's, it's important to, I think, remember that uh, there, there was no scientific evidence that uh, the atmosphere was being changed and was going to produce uh, catastrophic uh, climate change at that time. So it was more of an act of faith uh, by the uh, environmental movement. Uh, So uh, we continued the, uh, working with inflatables. Again, I have to say, you know, we didn't invent the inflatable. There were actually, you know, obviously commercial uh, inflatable warehouses available. This, this piece was uh, a pillow shape, 50 feet on a side. It was actually a commission. Uh, commissioned by a rock and roll promoter who, who was going to put on a concert in Japan. And the Japanese government was uh, requiring that he provide housing for all the uh, rock fans. And uh, that never happened. And uh, subsequently, we, uh, we demonstrated and, and rented this, um, this inflatable. Uh, for different kinds of events. Uh, the Freestone Conference in 1970 was a meeting of um, alternative uh, and sort of countercultural designers in Northern California. And the inflatable was then like the central meeting space uh, on a farm in Freestone. These uh, <coughs> experiments, uh, and I've just barely touched on them, uh, were eventually collected in the Inflato cookbook. And, you know, again, in the exhibition, there's a whole vitrine that has um, uh, the contents of the Inflato cookbook in it, uh, which is a, is, a, is, is a more detailed presentation. And I, I know that you've, you've already had the inflatable event here, which I, I guess was spectacularly um, successful. Uh, <coughs> so then, then we turned to uh, 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 the idea of a nomadic lifestyle, and this was focused around uh, the, the media van. This is the 
the first Ant Farm Media Van version one in, in 1970. And I, I do want to make the point, you can see that yes, we were hippies, uh, but we didn't, we didn't necessarily subscribe to the hippie aesthetic, which would require you know, shingles and uh, you know, repurposed wood. Uh, we were more into the high-tech um, aesthetic. So this, this project, uh, it had two components. And one was a kind of um, utopian idea about uh, designing a community, uh, a sort of a, a structure that would support a community of the new nomads who would be out on the road all the time. But they would, have, they would need uh, some basic services, the services that would normally come with um, living in a fixed uh, small town or place. And <coughs> um, I think this is in the exhibition also, but this is a sketch of uh, phase one of the truck stop network with three locations in, in California. And um, the idea was is that they were basically like truck stops or campgrounds, but what distinguished them was that uh, they would have a, a larger infrastructure of support services for this community. And it's kind of interesting, I, I don't know if you can read the uh, list of activities going on in, under this uh, inflatable, but it includes access to computer equipment, an overhead uh, system for moving things around, video access, laser access, a dark room. Uh, so it had, <coughs> these, were, these were gonna be media nomads and everybody should have access to some form of image making technology that could be also networked and communicated to other people in the community, uh, which today has been realized. So, so that was the, let's say, the larger utopian plan. At the same time, uh, we thought uh, we're just gonna go out on the road and try to prototype this idea. And so we uh, modified the media van in version two and uh, added the, uh, the trailer. Again, a military surplus trailer that was repurposed as a kitchen and had a solar collector, uh, a solar heated uh, inflatable shower and uh, some other um, you know, portable accoutrements. And inside the van itself was, uh, you know, back in those days we would, it would be described as a portable uh, VT studio, a portable videotape studio. But uh, what it really was was one uh, Sony porta pack and uh, you know 35 millimeter wide uh, uh, camera and the ability to uh, play it back from the truck uh, from the van. Jim Mayer demonstrating the the first generation of the Sony porta pack. Um, Felicity Scott has, has written about this project and describes the media van as a total surveillance vehicle. And uh, there, there was a, a, a product that was produced out of that, uh, that truck stop tour, uh, a kind of documentation using still photography of the, the roadside environment. And um, it was, it was done in 1971 or 1970, this, this particular tour, but some of the, uh, some of the uh, objects photographed were probably much older in a way. And, uh, and it was eventually uh, collected as a, as a series of slides and distributed by a company called Environmental Communications that specifically uh, made works for the architectural college library uh, circuit. <coughs> so in uh, 2008, uh, I went back uh, to that, that set of slides and made a piece that would juxtapose both the original slides on a light box and then they were also, the slides were cleaned and digitized and 
made into a slideshow so that they could be represented in a digital format. <coughs> and as we traveled on the, on the truck stop uh, tour, uh, we, we passed out this placemat, uh, the truck stop network. And it, um, it, was, a, it was a map um, that Curtis Schreier drew and it collected uh, the, the collected places that were uh, where we already knew people. We had possibly met through uh, mail art or through a, the alternative video uh, network and the publication Radical Software. So it was, in a way, <coughs> this truck stop tour about um, issues of networking and in some cases meeting people that we had had correspondence and uh, exchange all through the physical uh, snail mail prior to meeting them. Um, and then uh, also we would do demonstrations of this, uh, this life support package of the media van and the inflatable ice nine and uh, this one is at the University of Minnesota, where the audiovisual people have dragged these, uh, you know, 75-pound uh, monitors out onto the lawn for a, a screening. And they, what were we screening? We were shooting along the way, and then we would be playing back when we stopped. So it, it's kind of a, a strange combination of. In one, on the one hand, the latest available video technology that had just come out, and al almost like a, an archaic idea that information is passed face to face by going and visiting and having an exchange with people. Okay, this is a video of one of the stops on the truck stop tour. <coughs> Some, sometimes there would be a, there might be a slide lecture presented with this, and other times it would just be like this. It would be a kind of demonstration of this uh, package, which was a, you know, an idea that, you know, this could be a viable alternative uh, lifestyle. Commission uh, in, in 1972 uh, from a, a client who we had met in Houston in 1969. And um, this is a, a, a drawing that uh, collage that Doug Michaels made, I think, after an initial presentation of this, uh, of this house design. Uh, which is in the, the photographs that have been attached to this uh, sketch. And um, I, I include it because it's, it's an example of an unorthodox presentation <laughs> of an architectural idea, 
And uh, only much later did I realize how much mail had gone back and forth, mostly in one direction, to the client from uh, Doug. And it was all about uh, a kind of seduction and a kind of selling of the possibility of what uh, this architectural project could be. And her, her response was to say, uh, when she finally committed to uh, a $25,000 budget, that uh, it should be 50% art and 50% architecture. And you know that's really sort of a one, once in a lifetime uh, opportunity. This, this is a model that most looks like the sketch that's in that collage, I think. We called it the swamp thing. The, the location, uh, the site is uh, in a swamp uh, about 35 miles south of Houston towards the uh, Gulf of Mexico and on a man-made lake. And her, her father had, had manufactured this lake by building levees and capturing the water and stocking it with fish. And <coughs> so, you know, some feedback in, into the next phase of the design. And uh, as, at some point, though, we had to think about how this is going to actually be built. And I think the first two models imply probably sprayed urethane foam. Uh, but um, ultimately, we settled on a, uh, a system of thin shell concrete and actually used a, a technical manual for building concrete boats, boat hulls made of, of concrete. Uh, and so at that point, uh, it had to be, uh, you know, we had to figure out how to build it. Th these two models were both reconstructed uh, for an exhibition in 2007. Um, and, but, you know, back then we didn't have a rhino, for example. And so uh, what we did was we carved the clay model. It was, uh, there was a clay model produced. And then it was carved up, sliced up on a three-foot grid. And that was actually laid down and traced. And this gave us, uh, uh, and that was turned into a drawing that was uh, uh, the sh shaped. And this became not so much the structural grid, but a way of um, supporting the reinforcing rods that would be uh, ultimately the, the uh, interior steel structural support. And um, these are actually bent water pipes uh, to, to establish the, uh, the form. And then <coughs> several layers of chicken wire are, uh, well, well, first uh, reinforcing rods and then chicken, chicken wire as a, a sandwich. Uh, and the, uh, the concrete is not sprayed on, it's hand troweled on and pressed into this uh, mesh. Uh, so, uh, I neglected to mention that once the final design was approved, we uh, proposed that we would build it ourselves rather than turning it over to a contractor, which it seemed you know, just far-fetched that we could even find a, a, a suitable contractor. And um, so it was a design-build project. And, and part of that, a part of the advantage of the design-build was that the design process would continue during the construction. So, <coughs> for example, the, the floor that you can see laminated here was, uh, grew in part out of the fact that we had all this wooden uh, pine scaffolding holding up um, the structure. And uh, it was then laminated into uh, the floor and uh, dining table. And you can also see the, the three-foot grid. The, uh, the water pipes are, are, are exposed and um, the concrete has been pressed into the, into the mesh behind it. <coughs> uh, this is a shot just from the, uh, the Playboy magazine photo shoot. The, uh, the house eventually appeared, the house of the century, named, given that name by the husband of the client. 
and uh, it eventually appeared as a Playboy pad in, in Playboy. And, um, and actually there's a, uh, at, at Princeton, the, the, uh, some of the graduate students in critical studies have recently been studying Playboy and design. It's a project they've been doing. I did a presentation for them uh, a year ago. Uh, this was very labor intensive. It took uh, almost a year, mo more than a year actually, to, to build it um, and was completed in 1973. Uh, <coughs> it was, uh, it's a rather severe climate in, in, in uh, Houston and so for that reason it's, uh, the, the house was sealed and air conditioned and uh, Ultimately, that was probably a mistake. But uh, at any rate, uh, over the years, it turned out that the, uh, the client and her husband only slept in this house one time. <laughs> <laughs> and what they really liked to do was just go out there for the day and entertain people. And they would often bring food. And uh, so there may have been some miscommunication about that initially. Uh, but at any rate, what, what happened was uh, in, the, in the late 1990s, there was a flood here. And the water, the lake water, went up about, uh, I think, about 18 inches. And the house was flooded. And at the time, they, for whatever reason, they turned off the electricity and they elected to not address the problem of uh, uh, of drying and refinishing and so forth. And so it has been sitting basically since then. And uh, <coughs> you know, we, we always thought house of the century, it's, it's made of concrete, it's going to last 100 years. And here's an example of uh, you know, where, the, where the shell itself may you know, well last 100 years. But uh, now it's facing a rather substantial uh, cost of restoration. And I, I don't know if it will happen or not. Uh, and another example of the, the design occurring in the design build process was this, this entryway, which uh, wasn't in the original proposal, but because of the, because it was really wet and muddy when we started building, we realized it might be nice to have a uh, a mud room, and then you'd enter the house, and, and, and this, this tunnel was the result of that. <coughs> uh, be, because the, it took a, a year to build the House of the Century, there were a number of side projects during that time, and this is one of them, and it's, it's, it's kind of relevant to the trajectory uh, of Ant Farm. And it was called 100 Television Sets, and, and the idea was that it would be uh, an evolutionary diagram uh, so that you'd see in the distance the, the older sets. They're marching up out of the swamp, and then in the, right in the front, which is not pictured in this photo, would be three brand new living room style uh, color TVs wired, turned on, and just left on you know, as, as the installation. We couldn't sell that idea, and the, the piece was eventually destroyed. <coughs> uh, we headed back to California in 1973, and uh, again, through a network of uh, male artists, M-A-I-L artists, uh, we had corresponded with Stanley Marsh, and he had invited us to visit him in Amarillo, and it was sort of on the way, and we did that. And, uh, uh, out of that meeting, he invited uh, he invited Amphum to make a proposal. He had uh, worked with some other artists, including uh, John Chamberlain and uh, Robert Smithson. And <coughs> one thing that um, the th the three members of Ant Farm uh, shared, or three of us, three of the four partners, was growing up in the in the fifties and being car nuts and loving cars and understanding 
you know, the, the Cadillac was what you would aspire to. And this is a, this illustration, the 55 General Motors lineup. Uh, you know, the idea was you'd enter and buy a Chevy and then you'd kind of work your way up as you were, as your salary was going up or whatever and you, you got tenure or what, whatever happened. And finally, when you had arrived at, and it was always, of course, a male arrival uh, at success, you'd, you'd enter the world of Cadillac. And so that was a, <coughs> that's the backstory in a way to um, the Cadillac Ranch. Uh, and something that we, we shared and ironically, our fathers of only got as far as Oldsmobile. They never got to Cadillac. So in a way we were able to fulfill that ambition. Um, and we sent uh, this proposal to, to, to Stanley Marsh. Uh, the the Amphong drawings were often uh, architectural drawings. And uh, so th this project has sort of left the world of architecture, but it's still using architectural blueprint format. And uh, yeah, so he approved the idea and uh, we went down and bought the 10 appropriate model uh, Cadillacs. And uh, this is a uh, 1960 uh, sedan DeVille purchased from a used car, obviously a used car dealer. <laughs> and, and some of them came from uh, junkyards and were not operable, but about half of them were actually running vehicles. And, um, a number of things conspired to make this project uh, work, I think. And one of them was that uh, Amarillo has a very dry climate. It's in the Texas Panhandle. So cars don't rust as readily as they do in the north. It's far from Sunset Boulevard and the, uh, the oldest Cadillac pictured here, the 49, was the most expensive one. It, was, it had been semi-restored. I don't think this was an original paint color, but the owner was asking $700, and that's what we, we paid for it. But the, uh, on average, we paid $300 per car, and we're able to find all of the, the models to represent the, uh, again, it's an evolutionary diagram in the sense of the tail fin, the rise and fall of the, of the tail fin. And so it begins in 1949, uh, which is just a little fishtail light. And uh, it's not every consecutive year, but it's every model change is represented. And when you get to uh, actually 56, 57, 58, 59, 1960, the styling changes were significant enough each year that they had to be represented. And this, this was actually an unsustainable <laughs> paradigm for Detroit uh, auto uh, makers. You know, you couldn't uh, reprocess the design every year. Uh, it just wasn't financially uh, viable. Uh, so, so this uh, goes back to the, the proposed uh, drawing, the proposal and it's kind of the iconic mid, midpoint image, the 1959 Coupe de Ville. Um, and so another, another aspect, it was uh, <coughs> the, the, the ground was very hard at this, in this location. We hired a backhoe operator. He could, he could dig a very precise rectangular hole. And if, he, if every hole was the same depth and the same width, all you had to do is push the car in, and they would be at the same angle. And that, that's basically what happened, and it just took four days uh, to install. And on the fifth day, we had, had a, uh, you know, an opening reception, and that was June 21st, 1974. Um, <coughs> we took some precautions. We had the hubcaps welded on because we thought maybe people will try to steal hubcaps. You know. Uh, we didn't, didn't really think about any other sort of ways of uh, preserving or, or um, strengthening or, or, 
you know, I mean, it, but the, the one thing that, and the one uh, place that Stanley Marsh uh, participated, I think, but we all agreed that it, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't have a sign, it shouldn't have a wire fence around it, it shouldn't be captured, it should be just a public installation that um, the public would confront. And th it's visible from the freeway, from Interstate 40, but it requires, uh, that's a distant view, it's about 300 yards from the access road. So you, you have to stop and get out of your car and walk out there. So you, you actually enter into a kind of you know, shift from the position of, you've been on the freeway and you get out of the car and you're walking out and you're approaching uh, the object. And uh, you know, it's a very simple transition to turn the cars at this angle, but it totally shifts the perception of them as objects. And they're no longer functional cars, obviously. And it, it also, um, uh, you know, privileges the styling features. So <coughs> this is 10 years later, and uh, obviously people began by tagging and scratching into the paint and so forth and kicking in the glass and, and uh, doing what Americans love to do to the, all their monuments. Uh, we went, we went back to that original sketch for the invitation to the 10th anniversary party. And um, the, the interactions and the graffiti escalated from 1984 on. Uh, this is in 2004, the 30th anniversary. Beginning in 1994, uh, Stanley Marsh decided we're going for the party because we've had a party every 10 years. He's going to paint the cars white and then pass out uh, paint and markers and let the people who come to the party recreate the process of, of tagging the work. Um, one thing I, I think I is interesting and, and speaks to how the piece is cited is that uh, from the freeway, it's uh, readily visible and identifiable for what it is. But when you get out there, it's a different experience. So even in this advanced uh, state of decline, it still, I think, uh, you know, communicates the original purpose. It's been, uh, <coughs> it's been assigned meaning everything from uh, in, in, the, in the 80s during a economic downturn, both Newsweek and Time Magazine used photos of Cadillac Ranch to represent the end of the American auto industry, you know, in downturn. Uh, it, it, but it's also been used to, uh, to sell Chrysler's and Lincoln's <laughs> as TV ads for the, the competition. And um, we, we had an agreement with Stanley Marsh that he would always own the piece and the property and the family owns the property, but that the, uh, the Ann Farm would own the image rights to Cadillac Ranch. That's a, that was a handshake agreement and it um, persists to this day. <coughs> we didn't get paid for this one, but it is kind of a favorite of mine from a year ago in Vogue. It was a photo shoot that was done there. Uh, And they uh, noticed the uh, jewelry <laughs> in, in this shot is automotive hood ornaments uh, and medallions. And they, they also enhanced the landscape, you know, with uh, whatever. Um, so that was completed in, in 1974 and, <coughs> um, you know, there's, there's a kind of shift going on in our practice, in some ways away from architecture. So there was always, there was always a voice speaking to architecture, but there, there weren't always clients calling up or coming through the door. And, and, and we continued to invent and originate our own projects. And um, 
th this project, I think, is interesting because it was done in 1975, and it, at that time, um, the, there was an article, you know, describing how science, scientists had just discovered that the, the propellants in spray cans, the fluorocarbons, were destroying the ozone layer, and this would lead to, uh, you know, advanced cases of, of skin cancer. So the, the, the project was to make a time capsule called aerosol arsenal. Uh, it would be a 25-year time capsule, and it would collect all of the uh, current uh, aerosol uh, products from grocery store. And here's a list of uh, some, some, uh, some of them. Both easy off and easy on were included. And uh, they would be placed in a, a round a bakery type refrigerator, which we had. And, um, and that was it, you know. In 25 years, of course, there would be a change and you wouldn't be able to get these um, propellants any longer. And that, that was true. And in that case, the, uh, <coughs> the, the government response was, was clear and, and probably through the Environmental Protection Agency initiated um, the the fluorocarbons were outlawed and, you know, we went back to the pump um, squeeze thing. But at any rate, the, um, the proposed time capsule uh, aerosol arsenal was never fully realized and never exhibited. And we had a fire in our studio in 1978 and it was destroyed in that fire. Um, so somehow it's connected to, I think, the 100 television sets, the Cadillac Ranch, and the, the aerosol arsenal are, 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 are they're all ready-mades, you know, a different kind of idea about using ready-made um, objects. Um, <coughs> this project began in 1973. Uh, this is an early concept sketch titled Media Vision at that point. It's the, the, the back story here is that uh, uh, in a, because of our association with this alternative video movement, um, there, and which had a, a kind of um, ideology of the possibility of bankrupting broadcast television, you know, the monopoly of the three major TV networks um, could be uh, subjugated by a dem the democratized form of media production using video and their and cable TV and there could be you know everybody could become a producer of their own uh, TV content and uh, oh oh we have that now don't we on YouTube in a sense we do but anyway at that time you know th this was really posed as an opposition and uh, so th this project is about creating one image, one sort of iconic image, which is, is presented here as a modified uh, rogue vehicle crashing into a wall of TV sets. And, uh, <coughs> and it was proposed to some various uh, institutions, art institutions, but uh, there was no response, there was no support. It was too frightening in a way. And so we made a commitment that we're, okay, we're going to just do it ourselves anyway. We're going to produce this event. And uh, so Curtis began designing a logo for Media Burn. Coincidentally, we had a company car. It was a 59 Cadillac convertible. And um, the turning point was a, uh, a minor fender bender where somebody ran a red light and, and hit it and uh, we said, okay, that's it. Now we're gonna we're gonna make it into the uh, phantom dream car, this the, the, the perfect car to to uh, represent America and the destruction of uh, the the television sets. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so as so this project, and it's very really interesting to me because over the course of the of, of a year that it took to develop it and produce it all these other aspects started to get developed. Well, what, sh what day should it occur on? Well, July 4th, because 
then it will have, it can be wrapped in red, white, and blue bunting, and it's also usually a slow news day, so the TV uh, people will come out. And <coughs> the car itself, you know, is a symbolic kind of vehicle inspired by uh, our love of dream cars. This is the uh, Firebird 3, uh, no notable for having the most fins of any dream car. And, but the car itself was a, a work of sculpture, you know, and it, it had to go through some major mechanical modifications in order to, to uh, make it into a two-seater. So it's being driven from the back seat and all the controls had to be extended and the hood had to be extended. And, um, and so you see the cutaway drawing again by Curtis here. And then um, the uh, photo shoot where we were producing, you know, a postcard invitation to send people um, to invite them to Media Burn. And the paint job then came from, uh, you know, the National Transportation Safety testing of cars by crashing them. Since this car is going to crash, let's give it a crash paint job, uh, which is better, more visible here from the side. And um, finally, oh, there's another aspect of the, the kind of surrounding uh, aspects of the event. Uh, the, the postcard invitation is in the top there, the black and white postcard. Uh, to the left is the uh, press release, and to the right is the souvenir booklet. And so the logo is being applied to each of these things, the Media Burn logo. And um, let me just go back here. So finally the day arrived and we were able to um, rent the parking lot of the Cow Palace in South San Francisco for $150 for the day because there was no, nothing going on in the Cow Palace on July 4th. And so that's where it took place. And uh, we had uh, <coughs> sent the press release out to various news organizations. And we also, what's not pictured here is a press pass, but we, the press re re release said, you will have to wear the press pass to get into the press area. And sure enough, all four local TV stations sent crews, camera crew and a reporter wearing their press pass. And uh, you, this, is, this shot sort of defines the, the press area, uh, you can see the, the barricades off to the right where the public, for their safety, had to stay behind the barricade. Uh, Jim Mayer is in this shot. We had our own video crews, several video crews, and still photographers. In other words, we had just passed out uh, press passes to anybody we knew who had a camera. but. Um, but we had to have rent cops too to control the crowd, and uh, they're pictured here. And this is a, and so a clip. My fellow Americans, let me say this finally about Media Burn. The world may never understand what was done here today, but the image created here shall never be forgotten. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
So, uh, what, I, what I don't have then is the, uh, the news reports, which became a, a key element of the final uh, video. And, um, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave uh, th this DVD that has the restored version of, of Media Burn, so it can hopefully be made accessible to, uh, to people here to see the, the full length uh, video documentation. But so the idea was to create this image, and we, we got several versions of it. Um, and <coughs> as well as the slow motion film. And th the project then was um, distributed in two ways. One was a postcard, and, and this is the shot that was uh, used in, in the postcard. And eventually, you know, there were like 100,000 in print, and, and they were, but they were only being sold in, you know, specialty postcard shops uh, during the 70s and 80s. And, uh, and then also it was distributed on video. I'm sure you can get it on YouTube, but it's not a good quality version that is um, available there. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> I wanna jump in time and I'm, I'm skipping over a num any number of ant farm projects, the Dolphin Embassy, the 2020 vision, uh, the eternal frame, but uh, to focus on uh, a, a more current project, which was uh, going back and rethinking and revisiting the media van. And in, in its final uh, version in 1972, it was uh, what, what I would call version three. It was repainted and some further customizing was done and it was used as the, the logo vehicle for top value television. It was the media van for TV TV. And, um, but in, <coughs> in 2007, in, there was an exhibition at um, California College of Arts that was looking back at this, this period of time. And they had some of the uh, documentation and there was a poster of the media van there. And, I happened to run into, uh, at the opening, the, the media curator at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Rudolf Freiling, and he said, you know, does the, does the media van still exist? Because I'm doing an exhibition that I, I think it would be great to show it in. And I said, well, uh, you know, it could <laughs> possibly still exist. And uh, that began a conversation of, of that eventually led to uh, the museum commissioning us to actually redesign and re-envision it. And <coughs> um, we weren't interested in doing like a accurate recreation of it, you know, but rather a complete reinvention. So I think a as I've already pointed out, the original media van was a, a video viewing platform a production studio and, and also a social networking tool. So with those three uh, programmatic, uh, programmatic uh, purposes in mind, we began uh, designing, sketching. And so the we here is not exactly Ant Farm, but it's Curtis Schreier and myself, and we added a new collaborator, Bruce Tom, who is a, a San Francisco architect and uh, also artist. And um, so we looked at ways to optimize and increase the, for example, the, the potential that the van could have for as a viewing environment that these sketches kind of imply. And um, we also, uh, uh, thought about th the idea that maybe the van has been preserved all these years. Maybe it's just gone missing, but it's been covered in the preservative material and we should, you know, that should be part of it, uh, like roof roofing tar. And so <coughs> as we were conceptualizing it, we also produced this image um, as a kind of 
you know, representing what it could be uh, today. It has no wheels and it's kind of launched into space. So uh, it's, you know, it's wireless and it's also uh, going to be a post uh, oil, post internal combustion vehicle. And <coughs> th this sketch derives uh, from the fact that in the 70s, you know, people would often sit around a hookah and share, you know, the smoke. And, uh, but maybe a media hookah would be more appropriate to the present tense. And so here's a shot actually of a group of young people, students from Stanford, grouped around the media hookah, in <laughs> enjoying the, the interactivity of, uh, you know, they all have their handheld devices out in their hands and they are uh, connecting to the pipes of the media hookah. So the media hookah then becomes the center of the, the social interactivity in, in the project. Um, the interior of the van has been repurposed. Uh, that's the, you can see a fragment of the driver's side door. So the front bucket seats are gone and, and the bench is actually facing the rear of the van and it has a kind of conversation pit here. And, uh, and what, the, what the media hookah does, uh, so, <coughs> so it was actually finished and exhibited at um, SF MoMA. The show was called The Art of Participation. Um, and that's how it looked in the museum. And so at this point, it, um, I've already showed you one ant farm time capsule, the aerosol arsenal. This is a very brief history uh, because the time capsule became a re recurring uh, thematic project within Ant Farm. The first one was uh, at the invitation of the Paris Biennale in 1969. And um, this was simply a cardboard box full of uh, souvenir, uh, souvenirs of the uh, space landing on the moon, the Apollo mission combined with all sorts of cowboy Houston, Texas iconography. And what happened was it went to Paris it was the box was opened and exhibited, but they neglected to put a, a plexiglass box over it. And uh, you know, after two or three days, the box was empty. People just took things. <laughs> so for most of the exhibition, it was an empty box. Uh, and we, we haven't, hadn't really prescribed how they should exhibit it. Uh, another side project to when the House of the Century was being uh, worked on was uh, the second time capsule. Uh, this one was uh, on the occasion of the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston opening a new building designed by Gunnar Burkett. And um, we proposed uh, documenting, interviewing the artists and then collecting consumer products and putting them in this refrigerator. So <coughs> we sort of advanced the, the technology of the, of the how the time capsule, how things would be housed. But we, again, failed to specify where the time capsule should be stored in the museum once it was closed and sealed. And uh, there was a flash flood in Houston. It happens when they get a lot of rain. The storage room of the museum was uh, half a flight down. There was a, a, a ramp down to the loading dock and water came pouring down that ramp and everything was flooded and the time capsule floated. And furthermore, they, they weren't at all interested in opening it in 1984. When it was eventually opened, everything inside had turned to dust. That was in 2002. So that one was a, another failed time capsule. Uh, so that's so far three failed time capsules, failed in the sense of fulfilling a long-term ambition to function as a time capsule. And uh, the final one in 1975, a citizen's time capsule proposed as a 25-year time capsule. Uh, the project was at uh, Art Park in upstate New York. It's near uh, Niagara Falls and Lewiston. 
and they had a, a really unique and terrific program of inviting artists to come and do residencies during the summer, but there were no permanent works. So, you, so, so that was the one stipulation. The works could, had to be removed at the end of the summer. We proposed to bury this time capsule, which meant that it would effectively disappear at the end of the summer, and they allowed that. Uh, so uh <coughs> when the year 2000 rolled around, we called them up. Now the administration of Art Park has changed. They're no longer interested much in art. And furthermore, uh, now you have to take a core sample of the soil uh, to test for toxicity. And we, we actually, uh, there was a local museum that was willing to to take this project on, and apparently a core sample was taken, and it came back as questionable soil. And so uh, nobody wanted to touch that, and that th this car is uh, still buried at Art Park. And this is the burial, a shot of the burial ceremony. So <coughs> you'd think we've learned something <laughs> in all in those three uh, exercises. Uh, but this is going to be a digital time capsule. And the way it works is the media hookah has a computer uh, uh, inside. And uh, it's been, uh, you know, some special code has been written so that when you plug in your device, it uh, searches and randomly selects a file from your handheld device. And this is the interface, and it had a little animation. We didn't want to have any signage. And you know, sure enough, uh, anybody under 30 didn't need signage. They just sat down, and they took out their smartphone and plugged it right in. And what would happen, there would be uh, a little puff of smoke would appear, and then you would see your donation, which would be typically mostly uh, an image file and then it would join a, uh, a slideshow of other uh, photo work uh, against the background of a road. And, uh, and then it would be in the time capsule. And uh, also, the media hooker then would print out a receipt. And the receipt uh, has the date, <coughs> the, the file uh, name, and uh, down at the bottom, it, it, it would give you a, a discount at the museum store, which was, you know, a built-in incentive to donate to the uh, digital time capsule. Meanwhile, in the other function in the media van version 08 was playback. And um, this is the DVD menu, interactive menu, uh, based on the placemat that you saw earlier, and you've actually seen one of the um, videos, the media van at Tulane. And I think, I think actually they're all playing in the exhibition west of center in the kind of uh, representation of the interior of the media van. What's interesting, I think, is that we also included on the DVD, uh, if I go back, archival video. These are um, these were completely unedited, although they were often, the editing was done in the camera, but um, so they're, they're pretty boring, but they are a representation in an archival sense of uh, wor uh, additional works that were shot <coughs> during the original uh, truck stop tour in 1970. So the, the project then, it, it has a, uh, 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 a time frame from 1970 to 2030. And that's intentionally you know, pivoting on the new millennium. So the 2030 is the target date when the, the digital time capsule should be opened. Um, in the exhibition at SFMOMA, then we stage the closing event. Uh, and this is also within the tradition of the time capsule that the the burial is, a, is an event, a public event, putting it in the ground. In this case, it's not being put in the ground. 
but the last donation was made. The door was closed. And um, for people who came to this event, which was in the gallery at the museum, we produced a printout of all the files that had been collected. And we signed them, and we passed these out. So um, individually, you got one fragment, one fraction of uh, the time capsule. And, <coughs> and actually, you know, experts say the way to preserve digital information is to pass it around rather than lock it up. And um, so once, it, once the, the media van was sealed, closed, we uh, put it into playback mode, and it was then exhibiting the time capsule. It actually um, could, at that time, it could uh, select music files as well as picture files. Uh, but it was restricted from taking, you know, data files or text files. And uh, so uh, that meant that the playback had a soundtrack, uh, which was also randomly selected from people's uh, devices. Uh, and you could view it either through the front windshield or the back windows of the van uh, when it was in playback mode. OK, the exhibition ends. Obviously, we think the museum will want to acquire the media van and the time capsule. And once it's in the collection, it'll be preserved until the year 2030 and beyond. But they uh, decided not to acquire it. And <coughs> so we had this kind of internal debate, you know, that's like it's a time capsule, but can we exhibit it, you know? And we thought, well, yeah, it's digital information. It's probably uh, legitimate to e exhibit it in another form, which we did a year later uh, at Southern Exposure Gallery. And it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a light box with thumbnails um, with a long transparency. And in, in every file, some 4,200 and something files are uh, represented. So if, if you were a donor and you, you had your receipt, you could come to this exhibition and you could find your donation in the uh, chronology because it was cr uh, chronologically assembled. And there, there are two channels of video, um, the discovery video on the left and, uh, and on the right is a uh, what we call co-location dream, the final resting place for the media van uh, would ideally be in a co-location facility, uh, uh, an internet node, you know, the physical manifestation of which is uh, just a room full of servers and air conditioning, you know, and high security, right? Uh, so that, that hasn't actually happened. That's a, that is a rhino uh, rendering, actually. <laughs> and uh, it's an interesting aside. It's, it's, that was the first uh, exhibition and the first iteration of the time capsule. And it subsequently, uh, the media van traveled to France and made a second French time capsule. And then it came back. And of course, each time, the, the data medium has gotten smaller. And now it can be, it can be stored on a thumb drive. And uh, the, the fourth uh, and last uh, exhibition and time capsule was at the ASU Art Museum in Tempe, Arizona. And we're still now trying to find a concluding final resting place uh, for that project. So if you have any ideas, it's very open to them. Uh, the, the TV TV van was part of a, a project to videotape at the political conventions in 1972. It was a collection, an ad hoc collection of, uh, of video makers, and Ann Farm was part of that. And Steve Christensen is pictured here in his 1972 uh, form. And um, that in inspired for us a uh, architectural project or a sort of utopian city project 
which was done in, at a workshop at, at Rice University in 1972 after we came back from the convention. And it was uh, to design a city, a, a big, a large domed city with the world's largest uh, television studio under the dome, uh, a facility that would be specifically designed for conventions and would be completely wired uh, so that the, both the process of voting and transmission and broadcast, all aspects of that process would be distributed via media and this would be the physical place. And you, you can see this is a kind of schematic design. Uh, la this landscape was uh, never really detailed. There was a model made and there was a press conference at the end of this workshop at Rice. And um, you know, that was it. And there was never, <laughs> never much follow-up or uh, detailed design. But <coughs> it turned out that the, the model had been stored and sort of lost and found by Curtis, who's holding it here. And <coughs> it happened to fit into an, another exhibition at uh, SF MoMA, uh, this time not from the media department, but from the architecture and design department. And they were planning an exhibition about Buck Buckminster Fuller with a specific updating of how he influenced designers in the Bay Area. And uh, so it was exhibited, th this model then was um, actually went through some partial restoration, partial uh, completion, uh, which Curtis wanted to just think, oh, we found it, let's keep working on it, you know. And uh, the museum actually acquired it, so it got to be this very interesting discussion of what could be done to it, whether it was more valuable as is or with some minor modifications. And, and that was finally solved by proposing to build a new model that would be a detailed section taken out of the original model. And that's what, what's pictured here. It's the uh, convention chamber with the voting floor. And now it has two channels of video, which was in the original concept in 1972, but uh, wasn't you know, technologically very easy to realize back then. <coughs> so these models were then exhibited side by side. And um, I think you can also tell that this model didn't quite get finished <laughs> in time for the exhibition, but it was shown um, as is. And that's how I'm going to conclude. This is, this is a poster from uh, the 2020 Vision exhibition in 1974. That was then. And um, beginning, I think, tomorrow night and also playing next week at the Bijou Theater is the documentary Space, Land, and Time Underground Adventures with Ant Farm. And um, you can hear some of the same stories uh, you know, <laughs> in the documentary, but uh, they, they actually cover other projects that I haven't covered tonight. So um, that's, that's where there's more ant farm. And um, we were always interested in the future, and now is a particularly uh, important moment to be thinking about the future. And so I think this is a good image and quote to, to end with. Thank you. <laughs>